So we have seen one strategy for digging deeper to learn more about a passage is to use cross-references. And a second strategy that I want to talk to you about is comparing English translations. Um, there are two basic philosophies of English translation. You have a word-for-word a, um, -word approach. Sometimes we call that a literal approach, or the, the fancy term is a formal translation, or the, the idea is that they're concerned about preserving the form of the original Greek and Hebrew into the translation. So that's getting in terms of uh, sentence structure. It's uh, considering questions of um, trying in, in many cases to have a particular English word correspond to a, a given Greek or Hebrew word. Um, that would be more of a concern for translations like the King James or the New American Standard or the ESV. Um, these word-for-word -word translations can be very helpful in um, studying the Bible at a, at a deeper level because you are often able to, to see a, a greater degree of, of, um, of uh, precision and closeness going back to the Greek or Hebrew. So, for example, in doing a word study. Um, if you're searching for the word walk in Ephesians, that's going to be translating the Greek word for walk in each case there. It doesn't always happen that way, but in that case it, it would, where you'd uh, be able to uh, see a little bit more clearly where um, what the um, original Greek or Hebrew uh, might have, have said in terms of the structure, in terms of the particular words. That can be useful for uh, careful, you know, digging kind of study. Um, other translations, though, uh, we can think of these as idea for idea. They're trying to, they're, they're not so concerned with the actual structure of the original Greek or Hebrew or and, and it's not as much of a concern to try to always use the same English word to communicate what the Greek or Hebrew words would say. They're, they're really after the question of meaning. What does this passage mean? How, how could we make that as clear as possible to the um, audience, our modern readers? How could we try to bring that meaning from the ancient text to life in your Bible. Translations like, like the New Living or the NIV would probably be in this category. Um, the New English Translation, the Net Bible, several others. Um, now there's room for both of these to operate. Um, probably the most common uh, commonly used English Bible in the world for the past several decades is the, is the New International Version, uh, which um, tends to be more of an idea for idea, but is a, a something in the middle from, say, the message or the New Living to the King James or New American Standard on the other side. There's a, there's a spectrum here. And they can be used, they both serve different purposes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different goals of the translators. What makes some of these translations different? And then give you some examples from the book of Philippians. All translators want to communicate God's word. That's why they spend hours and days and months and years laboring over the original Greek and Hebrew, trying to think through what would best communicate uh, this particular passage in English in ways that we could understand. So uh, 
all of them are going to emphasize uh, accuracy, clarity, and readability. Um, but from there, there are some differences. So translations like the ESV or New American Standard um, would emphasize transparency to the original text. So what that means is they're, they're concerned to try to, you know, if there's a particular structure or particular words in Greek, they want to try to carry that over as much as possible into English. Whereas um, idea for idea translations are particularly concerned to make it transparent to the target readers, to uh, the, the people that are reading the Bible in the pew or at their kitchen table, just to make it as clear as possible, to not have a, um, sort of ambiguous or unnatural kind of English language, but to, to translate it in the sort of idiom that people talk in and, and think in and write in today. The word for word would try to translate particular words and phrases as um, closely as possible. The idea for idea are after trying to just capture what does this passage mean in its context. So a particular word might be translated with the same one or two English words uh, in the word for word translations like ESV and it might be translated five, six, seven different ways in an idea for idea translation because it might mean five or six or seven different things just depending on the context. Those are a little, that's a little bit of an introduction in terms of what, what's similar and different. Let me um, read now what the translators actually say. This is probably the least read section of your Bible, maybe rivaled by, you know, Obadiah. Um, the, the translator's preface. So this is, this is where they introduce what they're about. Here's, here's a section from the NIV. The first concern of the translators has continued to be the accuracy of the translation and its faithfulness to the intended meaning of the biblical authors. This has moved the translators to go beyond a formal word-for-word -word rendering of the original texts. Because thought patterns and syntax differ from language to language, accurate communication of the meaning of the biblical authors demands constant regard for varied contextual uses of words and idioms and for the frequent modification in sentence structures. So they're not doing this willy-nilly, but they say that the, the, the languages are, are different enough to where they need to take some liberties here. And those of you who have tried to uh, learn another language for any length of time can appreciate that um, there are some, some differences. Uh, you know, that the way that you might say something in Spanish is a little bit different than you'd say it in English. And it's a little bit different than you'd say it in German. There are particular idioms and, and phrases that would be specific to each. And an exact one-for-one one doesn't always apply. So thus far, the NIV. Now let's take a look at how the ESV translators explain what they're about. The ESV is an essentially literal translation that seeks as far as possible to capture the precise wording of the original text and the personal style of each biblical writer. Its emphasis is on word-for-word -word correspondence. It seeks to be as transparent to the original text, letting the reader see as directly as possible the structure and meaning of the original. So you see that they're, they're have, they have a little bit different goal here in their translations. Here are some of the other uh, issues that 
these, these translators have to deal with. The first is the question of audience. Who are we translating for? Who's going to buy our Bible? Who should be using this Bible? Um, you probably, the, the, the message translator doesn't have in mind somebody with a PhD in ancient Greek. But the, uh, somebody who's probably unchurched or, or uh, not very familiar with, with Christianity or um, is wanting something fresh and, and different. Um, whereas the, uh, you know, probably today, if you, if you handed the King James Bible to somebody that was a brand new Christian or that had never been to church, that, that person would probably be scratching their heads a little bit. Like, uh, apparently God doesn't speak my language, you know? So just to give a few examples, the question of audience. How, how high is the target reading level? How, how much technical vocabulary can we use? How, how familiar are they with Christian terms and, and theology? Consider, for example, Luke 2.7. Nice Christmas passage here. The King James says that she, Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Now the New Living says that she gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. The translators here are are accounting for the fact that most uh, readers today don't think in terms of swaddling cloths. Uh, you, you don't go to, to Target or Walmart and say, hey, can I have some swaddling cloths for my newborn? Now, you might not say, can I have some snuggly strips of cloth either. Um, it's probably good that they didn't go so far as to say, you know, wrapped him in a nice onesie or something. But you get the idea that they're trying to account for the fact that people today don't usually use the word swaddling clause unless they've learned the King James of Luke 2.7. Let's look at another example. The question of ambiguity. Sometimes the original Greek or Hebrew is a little bit unclear what it's exactly getting at. There's some ambiguity, some potential for a few different uh, ways of taking it. And so the question is, what do translators do with that? How much ambiguity do they seek to explain versus pass on? Are, are we wanting them to figure out the ambiguous passages for us or try to keep it in there so that we have to grapple with it? One example from 1 Timothy 2.15 the ESV says, yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, you might think, wait, she to they? What's, what's going on here? Well, that's actually the same sort of uh, challenge in the, the Greek of this passage. That, that's... That's the problem. How, how does the they relate to the she? And, and what does it mean to be saved through childbearing? You know, this is, this is a little bit unclear here. It's ambiguous. Um, you know, I thought salvation was through Christ, not through pregnancy and, and, and childbearing. What's, what's going on here? Well, tra- uh, the New American Standard says women will be preserved through the bearing of children. So notice she becomes plural women here. This is a little unusual for the New American Standard, which is usually a word for word. Um, and then you have if, if they continue. The Common English Bible, which is more of an idea for idea translation. Notice a wife 
will be brought safely through giving birth to their children if they both continue. So here it's, it's getting at uh, a man and a woman. That's, that's, that's how they're taking they. So you have here several different options. There's a question of what sort of salvation. Is this, is this salvation or preservation? Is this talking about Eve? Is this talking about women in general or, or a wife? What's, who, who's supposed to persevere in faith and love and holiness? It's ambiguous, and we see three different responses. Um, now, this is a case where it could be quite helpful to look at several of these translations and try to, to think through what the possible implications are. So to look at them as, in a sense, uh, first, first level commentaries on the biblical text. Often if something is, is ambiguous or unclear to me uh, in, say, the ESV, I might consult the NIV or another idea for idea translation to try to uh, see if, if they make things a little bit clearer. Uh, so rather than just pulling off a commenter on the shelf, my, my first approach would probably be to look at, the, at multiple translations to see if I can gain some clarity and illumination there. Now there is still a place for consulting the commentary and the study Bible. And you want to, you know, no, none of these tools are a substitute for just careful wrestling with a particular passage, reading it in context. But tra- translations can help here. Another uh, big debate, uh, especially in the, the last few years, is the question of inclusive language. Um, the um, original languages used singular pronouns um, that were masculine. So, he, him. Uh, in, in cases where there is definitely a male person uh, referred to, but also in, for a, a generic uh, any person sort of reference. And some translators have wrestled with that because not as many people today use that kind of language. We would often say, you know, <coughs> uh, they or them for uh, just the any person rather than him, lest the ladies feel left out. So there, there's some of the, the questions. Similarly with, with the word brothers, which shows up numerous times in, in the New Testament. Um, kind of like guys, you guys, in some parts of, of the country today you know, as sort of the, the inclusive, you know, or use guys, depending on where you're from. Um, so what does is, what is brother refer to? Is this talking about an actual male brother, like a sibling? Would this be taught? But those are a little bit clearer cases. Um, but what about a, a brother referring to another Christian? Uh, is that is that specifically a male fellow Christian, or is is there in view there men and women, any any fellow Christian? How do you, how do you articulate that in English? Consider Matthew eighteen fifteen. Often this verse gets uh, brought up if there's a conflict in the church, if there's some disagreement that needs to be worked through, or even church discipline. The ESV says this, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. This uh, pretty, pretty precisely follows the structure of the Greek text here, which uses singular masculine terms. 
Now, of course, this asks the, this raises the question, is this only talking about conflict between males in the church? Or would this apply also to women if they have a conflict? Do they have their own process? You know, or would this still apply? So notice the NIV here. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. So the NIV is saying, no, this isn't referring just to men. It's, it's your brother or sister. And their is referring to, it's referring back to, you know, the brother or sister, the any Christian. That's the idea. The new living, if another believer sins against you. Now, the new living is expecting a lower level of biblical knowledge in its readership. So, lest somebody read this and assume, oh man, well, good thing I'm an only child, so I don't have to follow this. You know, I don't have any brothers or sisters. Whew. Good, I don't want to confess my sin. Um, Say, no, this is talking about This is talking about brothers and sisters in the church. A fellow believer uses familial language uh, in the ESV and NIV and in the original. And so the New Living, to avoid misunderstandings, substitutes another believer. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the fault. So you see several different ways of dealing with uh, inclusive language. Let's look at an example. Philippians 1, 18 and 19. I'll compare the King James, the ESV, and the NIV. King James, Yea, and I will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. ESV, Yes, and I will rejoice, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So notice here you already have one key key difference. My salvation, my deliverance. Let's look at the NIV. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So, notice that the ESV and NIV both start a new sentence in verse 18. But the King James is continuing the sentence from the previous and puts a period right here. So, there's a little bit of a difference on where the sentences start and stop. You have certain things that are pretty clear. You could get the gist from any of these translations, uh, but... The question of, is this deliverance or salvation, is significant. Just to highlight here a couple of of differences. You have um, in, in green, I will rejoice or I will continue to rejoice. This, this ongoing idea. Um, what is the supply of? Of the Spirit. That's a little bit unusual. We wouldn't typically think of, of that. We typically use supply for like what happens in the back room of a big box retailer. You know, and that's not quite what's going on with the Spirit here. You don't just order a new one from the, supply, from the supplier. Um, ESV says the help of the Spirit. And NIV gets a little bit more clear here and says, it's, it's God's provision of the Spirit. And then, as I already noted, salvation or deliverance. So what? Uh, this raises the question in the context of what sort of deliverance does Paul have in mind? He's writing Philippians from prison. And so is he saying, uh, I hope this is going to turn out for my deliverance from prison? The word salvation, though, in the King James, it, it's, it, it is translating the word that 
normally in the New Testament we would translate salvation. Uh, and, and so I, I think probably that's right here. That Paul's not just looking to get out of jail, but he is looking to the last day and wanting Christ to be magnified in his body whether he lives or whether he dies. He wants to finish well. He wants to, to hear the well done, good and faithful servant. The, the, the experience, the joy of final salvation. And so his concern isn't just getting out of jail. He's saying, well, while I'm in jail, I'm going to preach about Jesus. If I get out, I'm going to preach about Jesus. Whatever happens to me, God's in control. My focus is on how can I finish well? How can I glorify God in whatever circumstance? Let's consider a next passage. Philippians 4.21 Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. Pretty simple passage here, right? Uh, That's the ESV. The NIV, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send their greetings. The New Living, give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings. So there are several different uh, decisions that the translators make here. One, you have the question of, of saints. You have saints, God's people, God's holy people. Three different ways of trying to get at what this term is. Now, here it's a question of of technical Christian vocabulary and avoiding possible misunderstandings. In our context, often the word saint is referring to somebody who has either been canonized by the Catholic Church or a super spiritual Christian. Whereas the New Testament uses this language to refer to all Christians who have been set apart as holy by God, not those who have achieved some sort of super spiritual status or who have met all the criteria uh, for the Pope. No, it's, it's any Christian that God has made holy. And so here you have, by comparing these, you have the ESV translating it saints because that's, the specific term that's in view here, the holy ones, then you have, but it's, it's referring to God's people, God's holy people. And then this is getting into the question of, of gender inclusive language. The brothers who are with me, or is it the brothers and sisters who are with me? And further, what does it mean to be in Christ? God's people in Christ, all who belong to Christ Jesus. So, if I was trying to explain what it meant to be in Christ to somebody that's a new believer, it it might be helpful here to refer to the new living. This is referring, uh, you know, it's not like I'm in Dallas and then I'm in Minneapolis. It's not that kind of in. It's not like I'm in good graces or I'm in trouble. This is, this is referring to a, a position that somebody has by faith, uh, a status, a position uh, identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, where God sees us in this vital relationship with his son. And so the new living here is saying, it's about belonging to Jesus. And, and so they're taking some liberties. They're adding some words. The Greek text just says, in Christ Jesus. Uh, but 
it, it's getting at the idea of being in vital relationship with Jesus, belonging to him. So you see how they complement each other, I think. So, just a, another way of visualizing it here in, in blue and in red in green. Let's, let's summarize. This, this raises the question of, okay, who's, who's actually in prison with Paul? Is, is he with, surrounded by men and women believers? Or is it just men, like Timothy? Um, so, it, brothers in Greek is a little bit ambiguous here. Um, should, should the translators preserve or explain technical uh, or potentially ambiguous theological language like saints or in Christ Jesus? I like to think of the, the wealth of translations that we have like a bunch of commentaries. You can go, and these are, are freely available to anybody in the world if, that has access to the internet. You can go to a website like Bible Gateway or Blue Letter Bible or BibleArc.com or many others and, and s- compare multiple versions very easily. Many of us also probably have more than one translation at home and we could just open them up and, uh, and compare and contrast. So really we have, uh, you know, all, all translations are having to make interpretive decisions. They're having to interpret what they, what they are translating. And so because of that, we can treat them something like first-level commentaries. I recommend choosing one particular translation, like the, like the ESV, for example, to be your main study Bible, but then to supplement freely with other translations. And it can be also helpful to, you know, vary your, your reading to, to have, have some freshness and vitality in your, in your study of Scripture. Oftentimes you, you hear things in a fresh way if it's in a different translation than you would normally use. Um, and also, depending on your audience, you might want to, to, com- to read from a particular version or a particular version that you think captures the, the main idea. Uh, of the passage in a in a clearer way. So those are just a few ways to think about using different Bible translations.